Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, count number of trees. And before we even get started, I feel so dumb after solving this problem. I feel like it's a classic dynamic programming bait and switch where the problem can be solved with dynamic programming. So it makes you think to solve it with dynamic programming and it does work in this case. The first solution I came up with was n squared time and n squared space. That one actually gave me memory limit exceeded, believe it or not. So I was able to get the memory down to O of n and that was with the recursive solution. And there is a way to then code it up with the bottom up solution, but the bottom up solution won't have any improvements actually. Like the memory will still be the same. You can't really optimize the memory doing it with the classic like dynamic programming way. And then there's kind of, I don't even know how to describe the solution. It feels like a greedy solution, but there's a clever solution that is O of n squared time, O of one space. And it's so damn simple that it makes you wonder how could you have possibly missed it? So honestly, this is the one I'm gonna start with first. I'll show you my solution for the other two, but I think if you're gonna try to understand this problem, the greedy one is probably the way to go. The idea is we're given an input array. Suppose it looks like this. That's the only parameter we're given. So pretty simple in terms of that. We want to create three values, all right? We want like a subset of three values from here. Consider it like a subsequence, even though that's not the word that they use in this problem. But we want every single one to be of exactly size three. And we want all values where all three of them, suppose these three are in ascending order, right? Each of these is increasing. Or we want the ones that are in descending order. So this one, this one, and this one as well. And another one for descending order would be this one. So we wanna count all of those, the ones that are in ascending order and the ones that are in descending order as well. One thing to note about this problem is that every single one of these is distinct. They're not necessarily sorted or anything like that, but they are distinct. So immediately I thought, okay, since it seems like a subsequence problem, let's start doing some decision tree stuff, right? So we have a pointer I, we iterate through the input, we keep track of what the previous element was so that we can like compare elements and see if they're in increasing order or maybe in decreasing order. And also we keep track of how many elements we have, like the current count, because as soon as we have exactly three elements that we've already chosen, then we're done. So that is a way that works. What I found though, is that when you're doing the caching for that type of solution, you're keeping track of the current index i, and you're also keeping track of what the previous element was. And like another thing, the count, this is not going to be too bad. It's a constant. It's never going to be larger than three. This one though, could be any element from the input. So that's n. This one obviously could be any element here. So that's also n. So this would be n squared memory when you do caching with this. There is a way to get around that. I'll show you my solution probably towards the end of that, how I kind of eliminated this parameter. The time complexity stayed the same. It's just that we kind of had to add a loop inside of the recursive solution. And anytime we pass in an index i, we kind of say that we've already chosen that element. It's not that we can possibly skip that element. So that's kind of the intuition. But again, this is not what I wanna focus on. I wanna focus on the clever solution. Maybe you've already been thinking about what it could possibly be. Maybe you already thought of what it is. Well, why start at the first element and why even start at the last element? So we're trying to fill three spots here, right? If we start here, well, then we got to find two more elements that are greater than it. And those two elements have to also be in strictly increasing order or, um, you know, decreasing order. So why start there or why start here? We're gonna have the exact same problem doing that way. We have a third choice, actually. You can start at the middle. If you want to pause this video right now and try to figure out the solution yourself, you might actually be able to, because I'm about to tell you what it is because it's so damn simple. If we start at the middle element, then don't we only just need to find the elements on the left that are smaller than it? Let's assume that right now we're trying to count all triplets that are in ascending order. We just need one element on the left that's smaller and we just need one element on the right that's greater. So why not go through every single element in the input, consider it as the middle. Let's take this one for example. If this is the middle element, let's count all values on the left that are smaller than three. How many were there? Just a single one this time, but there could have been multiple, right? Imagine one, two here. So we count that much, however many are smaller. 
And then we do the same thing on the right side. Just go through all elements on the right, count how many are greater. It's just one this time, but obviously it could have been more. Now from those, we're not gonna sum these two values. We're actually gonna multiply them because suppose we had something like this where let's say there was a one over here and a two there and uh, suppose over here there's like a six, right? So there's two elements on the left that are smaller than three, two elements on the right that are greater than three. So we're kind of just picking combinations. We can choose one of these one choose two there's two choices or we can choose one of these there's two choices so like i could draw out the decision tree and you'd realize that we're just taking the product of these so like four or six and this is four six as well so like this would be all the possible choices but basically you're multiplying the count so take this count and this count and multiply them together that was for ascending you might think okay well, we can run another loop to do the same thing find all elements on the left that are larger and then find all elements on the right that are smaller we could run another loop to do that but there is a math formula where if you already had what i showed you earlier you can then calculate this and this immediately the quick intuition behind that is this suppose we're here let's just add the indexes 0 1 2 3 4 suppose this is our middle if we counted that there was one element on the left that was smaller than three well we're at index two there are two elements to the left of that index it's just the index itself right that will tell us how many total elements are to the left of it if one of them was smaller than three then the remaining elements are going to be larger than three and that's only true because every element in the input is distinct so that's how we get that and same thing on the right side if we want to know how many elements are to the right of this we can take the length which is not going to be this index the length is actually going to be five so we'd need to subtract the middle index from that and then subtract one as well that would give us two two elements are to the right of this and then from those elements we already know how many of them are larger than three so if we subtract that count then we'd have the leftovers which are the ones that are smaller than three so that's just a bit of math once you have that you can take the product of those two as well and then add that to the result as well and then you're pretty much done you just kind of do that considering every single element in the input as the middle element well, I guess we could probably skip this one and the last one because they don't have an element to the left and this one doesn't have an element to the right. So that's the idea. The main thing about this solution is it's a lot easier to code up. It's a lot easier to reason about than the dynamic programming solutions I'll quickly mention at the end of this video. In terms of time complexity, you'll see that we're just doing nested loops. It's going to be n squared. And you'll see that we don't need any data structures. We're pretty much just counting. So the space complexity is going to be constant. The first thing I'm going to do is just declare a variable for the result. That's where we're going to be counting all of the triplets. And then I'm going to say for middle in range, we're going to skip index zero. So let's just start at one and then we'll go length minus one so that we skip the last index as well. Then we want to first count the ones that are in ascending order. So what I'm going to do is have a variable called left smaller. That's going to be initially zero. And at the same time, I guess I might as well declare right larger and set that to zero as well. Then we're going to have a loop. First, we want to count how many are smaller and to the left. So let's have a loop for i in range every element to the left of our middle pointer. And let's check if the value at i is less than the value at the middle pointer. Well, then let's increment left smaller. Then we're going to have a loop that goes through every element after the element at index um, m. So m plus 1 up until the end of the array. And then we'll check kind of the opposite. So I'll quickly copy and paste this and just change the inequality sign. We want elements that are greater than the middle element. If that's the case, let's increment this one right larger. Okay, now we can do the first step, which is add to the result the product of left smaller and right larger. So this is us counting the ones that are in ascending order. Now we wanna do the same thing for the elements to count the ones in descending order so i'm going to have my variable left larger how do we calculate that one again well let's take all the elements that are to the left of the middle pointer we can get that with just the index m and we want to subtract from that the elements on the left that were smaller so let's just take that and then subtract 
That one was pretty easy. The next one's a bit more complicated, right larger. How do we get that? Well, the elements to the right are gonna be the length of ratings minus M minus one. This is just the formula that tells us how many elements are to the right of this pointer. And so from that, we wanna subtract the elements on the right that were larger. So that uh, reminds me, I misnamed this. This should be right smaller. That's what we're trying to calculate. So from this, I'm gonna subtract right larger. Now, after you've calculated those two formulas, let's add to the result the product of these two. And now we're pretty much done. I promise you this solution is so much simpler than the next two I'm about to show you. Okay, add a typo, ratings should not be ratings. It should just be singular. But you can see this one works and it's really efficient. Now I'll kind of just show you the code for the other approaches. So this is the first recursive, like the memoization solution that I came up with. I'll quickly just go through like the high level logic. It's mostly just a decision tree. So we have a parameter I. And before I even get into this function, let me show you how I'm using this function. I'm gonna go through every starting point I in the input. I'm gonna say this is my starting point and I must include this element. I don't have a choice. I can't skip that element, I must include it. I'm passing in another parameter because we need to count the ones in ascending order and the ones in descending order. I could have written a separate function for that, but it's a little bit easier just to have a variable. And if the variable is true, we will check if the elements are in increasing order. And if it's false, we'll check that they're in descending order. And we have a third parameter which tells us how many elements we have so far. If we must include the element at index i, therefore we start with one element. The base case, of course, is when we have exactly three elements, in which case we return one. The other base case is we reach the end of the array, but we still don't have three elements, therefore we return zero. Now, inside the recursive case is this. I'm gonna go through every element after index i, that's why I'm starting at i plus one, and I'm checking, did we find an element? Like if we're looking for ascending order, did we find an element that's greater than the one that we must include? If so, let's do the recursive case, where now we're starting at index j and we must include it. We're pretty much saying we've already included that element, therefore we incremented the count by one, and of course this one ascending, it would stay the same. We do the same thing for descending order. It's just, yeah, it's, it's literally the exact same line of code. So if I wanted, I could probably condense these two, but I don't think that would make it any more readable. So I'm not going to do that, but you can if you would like. And the last thing is we are doing some caching here. Now it might seem misleading because we have three variables here, but keep in mind that I is the one that's gonna be a variable length. It's gonna be of the size of the input. That's how many possible values I could be. Ascending, it's either gonna be true or false, and count is either gonna be one, two, or three. So those are just constants. Those matter in the cache, but they don't change the overall time complexity or the space complexity. The space complexity is gonna be O of N. The time complexity, though, is also gonna be O of N. You might think that's not the case because we have an outer loop here, and then we have a loop inside of this one as well. But remember that like the possible ways that we could call this function is n squared. I believe that's correct. If I'm wrong, please let me know, but I'm pretty sure given that we're caching this and the number of sub problems itself is proportional to n, even though we have a loop inside of here, the time complexity is gonna be uh, n times n. So it's gonna be n squared. I'll quickly run this just to see how it performs, but I believe it's not gonna be as efficient because there's a lot more overhead with this solution. So let's just see. Yep, so in terms of big O time complexity, it's the same, but in terms of the real runtime, it's not as efficient. And so this is the bottom up dynamic programming solution. And so the first thing I should say is the way we're gonna be doing caching is gonna be a little bit different. I think it's just a bit more natural to have two different variables in this case. I think in the recursion case, it made more sense to pass in another variable and then just use that a part, as a part of our like hash map cache. Um, this one, I think we're gonna have two of these. We could make it a three dimensional cache, but I think it's better to just separate them out. The logic, I guess, like the sub problems that we're solving in this case is slightly inverted compared to the top down approach. The first thing you might notice here is that we're initializing everything in this group 
in this like sort of column with one. What does that mean? Well, the way we're considering the subproblem here is slightly different. And I think we should probably just start with the recurrence relation here and here. So we're counting ascending and descending sort of at the same time. But what this is saying, what this represents is starting at index i. How many groups of size this, this count variable, can I create? that are in ascending order. The base case is how many groups of size one can I create in ascending order? Of course, any value that's of size one starting at any particular index is going to be a group that's in ascending order and a group that's in descending order. It's of size one. It can't really not be in ascending or descending order. So that's the base case. Here though, let's say for the first outer loop here, I want to start counting groups of size two that are in ascending order. So that's my first task here. I want to now start counting groups of size two. So I'm starting at index I, I'm considering every single starting point in the input, and then I'm going to go through J. J is going to start after I, similar to how we did it in the recursive case. And so if I find an element at index J that's greater than the element at index I, well, then I just found a group of size two, right? So I can say starting at index I, groups of size two, are going to be incremented by this variable, which should be one in the first case. Uh, but in the next case, it'll be a little bit different, which is why I'm writing the formula here. So starting at J, how many groups of size this could we create? If count is two, then this is going to be one. And that's how it's going to correspond to the base case. Now assume I'm doing the same thing for groups of size three. By the way, this loop, it might look misleading if you don't know Python. It's going to end at three. It's not going to count groups of size four. So next count is three. I want to count groups of size three starting from here that are in ascending order. So if I find now at index I, I found an element that's greater than it at index J. OK, I want to add to this the element here. Initially, this is going to be zero. That's why we initialize these two uh, arrays with zero. I want to add to this now, though, starting at J, how many groups of size two do we have? So that's what I'm incrementing with this. And of course, we're doing the exact same thing for descending order. It's just that the variable is different. The count minus one is the same. And this part is also the same. So after we've done all that, the next step is figuring out how to calculate the final result. And that's pretty much just a matter of aggregating all the groups of size three that were in ascending order and groups of size three that were in descending order. You might think of trying to use the sum function to do that, but with the way we kind of initialize these, you can't really do that because this is a column that we're trying to sum and this is a column. It's not just a subarray, so you can't really do that with the sum function. So we aggregate that in this variable and then we return it. I'll run this one as well. And here you can see, I guess it's about as efficient as the recursive one was. If you found this helpful, check out neatcode.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.